Hello everyone. Uh, today our second session with uh, Dino and Jeff. Uh, just uh, let me introduce them. Actually, uh, as you know, Dino is the father of Lisp and Jeff is doing many things in the especially routing area in IETF. So many slides we have, so many things to talk, uh, mainly on Lisp. There are many use cases uh, today we will be uh, going through. So let's start. Welcome, by the way, Dino and Jeff. Welcome to you. Great to have you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining again. Um, I guess this is the second session. It might be two of two, but it could be two of n. We don't know how many more um, sessions we'll have. But there's a lot of Lisp use cases that um, you might want to go in depth. And if so, we can continue in the um, future sessions. The last session, what we did is we talked about mostly about the data plane and how it worked. And we talked about fundamentals of Lisp. Uh, EID space and Arlo space. Uh, what we didn't have time for was to talk about the mapping system up here. And that's what we're, where we were going to um, start, if that's okay with everybody. Um, you can interrupt any time with questions. Um, this is more of a working group slash discussion, not a formal presentation. I have a half a dozen um, slide sets, but I'm only going to show you the kind of salient points of, of what's going on. So I'd like to start with talking about the mapping system um, and then go into these three different use cases. These are the kind of three modern use cases that I'm working on with Lisp right now. The first one is how to run um, the blockchain applications and using um, contracts and cryptocurrencies and those things, how to run that block with a blockchain over an overlay using Lisp, of course. So we could talk about that for a little bit. Um, I've, we've also um, have done a proposal on how this can be used in the 5G um, next generation core network. Um, so we could just do some, show you some highlights about the activity that's going on IETF. Um, that's this slide set. And this is an IoT slide set where um, you can use strong authentication with digital signatures to register your mappings to the mapping system as well as um, requiring a signature on a map request to get mappings. And that is, that's an extra, a, a demo that's a minute 45 in length. I don't know, you think, Orhan, we could run that demo? It's minute 45, shouldn't be long. Yeah, it should be long, but uh, yeah. maybe the time okay. on next session. Huh. Oh yeah, sure, okay. Just uh, the audience could just tell me where they want me to focus. Um, these two slides that's up here, I've done uh, demos of Lisp running on an iPhone, both a unicast demo and a multicast demo. I could show you the work that we're doing by putting Lisp direct, directly on a cell phone that's actually moving around and how we can make use of um, all the radios on the phone. If we can do that, and so, uh, do you know, if we can do that, if we can put the Lisp code on the, directly on the UE, so user and device. So we can use then yeah. Lisp for the IPv6 transition mechanism as well. You certainly could, yeah. It's Absolutely. because reminded me immediately, exactly. immediately reminded me 464xlat. So as a uh, transition mechanism, which we put the uh, NAT on the phone as well, CLAT, yeah. CLAT part. So why not Lisp? Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I just want to make one comment because that was one of the questions we were going to start with was. Can this be used for IPv6 transition? And I, what I said last time when the question was asked, can is Lisp replacing BGP? And what we said is, well, they coexist and they need each other. This is exactly the same answer for IPv6. Uh, if we want ubiquitous IPv6 anywhere on Earth, and you have some IPv4 clouds, you just use IPv6 EIDs over IPv4 Arlo's. And Lisp can list by using an overlay. Um, can allow IPv6 to be deployed on the end systems much faster. Because today the problem we have is if you want two endpoints that open up um, uh, an IPv6 TCP connection, you have to have an IPv6 every hop between the two. And that doesn't always exist today. So having an overlay and running to run IPv6 at your house through a NAT um, list with NAT traversal and using IPv4 R loads can make that all happen. So um, another motivation when I left Cisco was not only to have Lisp be more ubiquitous across vendors, but I wanted it to accelerate the adoption 
of IPv6. And we'll show in this demo right here, to be able to get good security, we use IPv6 addresses as EIDs, but we call them crypto EIDs, which means we put cryptographic material in the IPv6 address to make end systems, as well as who you can talk to, um, pretty secure with digital signatures. So that's quite interesting. So IPv6 helps in a lot, a lot of respects because you have 128 bits to work with. You could build random ephemeral addresses so people can't track you. You can use crypto EIDs and sign application messages with it or interface with the mapping system with these cryptographic um, EIDs. Okay. okay. Orhan, where do you want me to, uh, do any other questions or you want me to move on? So we have uh, multiple questions, but we, we will go through these slides, I think. So 1 billion registrations, for example, it says it's interesting. So let's go through, uh, let's start maybe talking about it and then move on to the other topics. Like I uh, definitely this in 5G core you said, it's very interesting as well. Uh, <laughs> these are all interesting use cases, so I want to listen all. So as long as time so, permits, as long as time permits, yeah. like one hour, one and a half hour probably, the discussion about, today also yeah, is there. About an hour, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it turns out that um, the list mobile node demo and the the list um, network demo, the 5G, is about all about mobility. So we that's actually kind of a, a fourth use case because um, in this demo, the the EID and our look are in the same system that's moving. Where here the EID is in the UE, but the R loops are actually the E node Bs um, that are inside the 5G network that are on the border of the core and the RAN, the radio access network. So we'll we'll talk about that um, next. But let's talk about the the, the control plane. Um, let me just bring this one this up for real quick. So the mapping system is relatively simple in concept. It maps um, an EIDA to an R log set X. And um, you can have multiple R logs and you who cache this entry can actually encapsulate packets to a list of them. You can test the R logs to see what their connectivity is. And we have a lot of list telemetry stuff that we could talk about later that's used to, to test is X better than X prime versus X double prime or whatever. And then you can make changes at the edge to decide where you want packets to go. Um, but the list mapping system is pretty simple. It holds these mappings. The EID to our log set mappings is no different than any other key value store in a database. And so this is a regular database. Um, it can be made immutable if you want it to not change at all. So it could have properties like blockchain but right now, if you register, if this um, XTR registers B with itself Y as the R log and later decides its IP address into the core changes, it could then register B with Y prime. And what happens is Y prime overwrites Y. So right now it is a mutable or dynamic database, okay? Um, so there's very, it's very simple. The way you put things into the mapping system is with map register messages. And the way that you get mappings is with map request messages. And those are the two fundamental um, primitives that you use or APIs or whatever, however you want to call it. So but list is made, the mapping system is made up of a bunch of map servers and that's where all the XTRs register the mappings to. Um, they register to one or two map servers and no more. So it's not a push, it's the registers are sent to only two places and everybody in the world that wants to get those mappings, the map request will find its way to those map servers. There are other and other messages as well, right? Uh, you know, like map notify, SMR, so those kind of messages. Um, not sure if you will uh, explain them, but I have a question uh, on that. I, I, I certainly will explain that. Sure, them. okay, then when we come there, let me ask better. Okay, okay. Uh, so when XTRX wants to be able, it, it receives a packet from A going to B, and it doesn't have the R load for B, it has to send a map request to the mapping system. That map request is sent to a set of map resolvers. And then the mapping transport, the mapping database transport system is how all the map resolvers and map servers connect to each other. 
But the idea is, is that the map request the sent system, the map requests EID, that the target EID that you're looking up finds its way to a, one or more registered map servers. And then either the map server, if it's configured a proxy reply, will send a map reply back saying here are the mappings. Or it can forward the map request to one or more of the RLOCs for EIDB site, and then it will send the map reply back. The reason we have both of these modes is because we may want a mapping system provider, an MSP we call it, to be able to respond um, um, because it has policies that are more centralized versus if we sent the map request here, we're allowing the policy for the end site to be able to decide um, what our looks are given or what priorities. And what's interesting is when a map request comes here, uh, this XTR knows the source of the map request. And if it's in the US versus Europe, it may want to return a higher priority look, our look for the US versus Euro so we can give a better shortest path along the underlay. But in both so modes, actually, in both modes, uh, it can be done by the destination. I mean, uh, either proxy reply also, because uh, XTR is telling to the map server that these are the priorities weights. So I want to get to this RLOC more traffic than this one. Uh, in both centralized, so in centralized mean uh, map, map server is replying the answer to the uh, source place. Or in the distributed mode, which basically the destination site uh, is replying, in both of these operations, uh, basically, uh, still destination is controlling the weights, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, just a question on where you want the policy to be managed by. You want it to be managed by the entity that's buying the service from the mapping service provider, or do you want the provider to manage it? And it'll be, it, it's, there's a lot of business reasons to choose one versus the other as well. So, like, for instance, when, you know, that host B site could basically be a cell phone, right? And you probably don't want to put policy here because you want to make it more user friendly. In that case, the mapping service provider that supports the registrations from this phone could proxy reply and do the policy versus a multi-homed site for a national company that has two routers connecting to two different service providers and there's an IT department that wants to be able to take shortest paths, then maybe the, maybe the, the customer, the LISP site itself, wants to do the management. Yeah, wants to do the control of the wider network, yeah. Yeah, correct, correct. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll focus now on why does the mapping system scale so well. The mapping system is, is uh, pretty much uh, designed like the DNS system, which means we use um, map referrals um, to be able to find the right map server when a map request comes in. Um, and what we decided to do with the mapping system, you know, we talked with my, uh, Paul Makapetris quite a bit, the inventor of DNS, and the sort of things with DNS was, it was supposed to be a slow updating system in the old days, and that administratively you would change entries. Well, with LISP, we want mappings to be dynamic and change, and we also want the mapping system to notify um, entities that have cached these mappings that a change has occurred. And so we've turned it into a pub-sub model as well as a, a referral model. And the idea here is if you look at the basic operation, is if the ITR would send a map request to a configured map resolver, say it sends a map request for like this 11.222 thing, we know that that site has been registered to MS3 and MS4 here. But the question is, is if this map resolver doesn't have that map server cache, then what it does is it, it asks the roots, and the root then gives it a referral to ask the next level, and then you finally get a map server. So there's a referral cache in this map resolver that knows where all the map servers are. This is really important because as um, this 11.222 um, is actually changing our loads. The R loads are only being changed in these two locations. And all the map requests that are currently flowing into the system always find their way here. So you don't have to push these mappings everywhere and you don't have to update these caches that are a part of the mapping system. That's key to make this mobility scale on a large scale. Okay. So uh, Oran is 
sitting in, uh, where are you sitting in Greece or uh, it's, Turkey, right? It's you're in Turkey. Turkey and you get on an airplane, um, you, your hour look is mapped to your service provider in Turkey. Um, your EID doesn't change, it's always Orhan. He gets off a plane in Paris and what happens is he still will talk to the same map resolver because it's configured in the system. And now that he gets a connection to the underlay, he'll get a new Arlok, say in Orange or France tele Telecom or whatever. That Arlok now will be registered to the same two map servers that he registered to when he was in Turkey. So anybody that any new sources now that want to talk to him just send a, a map request to the system for his EID, and then these map servers will now have the new Arlok. Okay, so that so the amount of messaging that's being done. Is, um, is really kept to a minimum. Now, if I was talking to Orhan while he was in Turkey and now he's moved to Paris, of course, while he's flying and, well, there's a lot of issues about, you know, how things are updated because when people move, you actually disconnect from one location and reconnect to, to another location. And if you're on a high-speed train somewhere in Europe, that happens really quickly. But in this example, when you jump on an airplane, he's two or three hours not registered, so the registration will time out and you won't be re-registered. Um, so, so I'll be basically encapsulating packets to this Arlok that's in Turkey that doesn't reach him because he's not physically connected to it, right? But when he appears in Paris and the mapping has changed, these map servers know that they changed from a Turkey Arlok to a, a Paris Arlok and that Dino has it cached because I subscribed to his EID that I get a map notify message back from the map servers telling me that now the new Arlok or Arloks, right, he could be attached to a Wi-Fi network in the hotel as well as Orange LTE, and I might get a pair of Arloks back, and now I can start encapsulating, load splitting them across the two in Paris, or choose one versus the other. So map server will... So with the mobile case, it works really well because when you pop up in your country and you register, all your signaling and traffic is actually encapsulated and tuned to your original location. So if you pop up in France, your anchor node is still in Turkey. This is where your policy takes place, right? This is how uh, mobile roaming is actually working. So it works really well in this case. So well, it's in the, in the, well, in this case, we take the shortest path. There's like no home agent like in mobile IP. What we, what we did at Cisco was if, for instance, Dino was now still encapsulating um, to Turkey, and it was a Cisco box acting ex as an XDR, the Cisco box would know if the EID has actually moved. And if so, it sends a data-driven SMR back to me saying, go do a new lookup because he's no longer here. Now, if I do a lookup and he's still on the airplane, the mapping system's gonna tell me he's not there. So I could stop sending and maybe try later. If I try later and, and he lands and he's registered, I'll get the Paris Arlo. But there is really no home agent. The EID Orhan is completely independent and mobile, and he just attaches to other places. Um, I don't know he has a home. His home, as far as I'm concerned, is what his Arlok said is in the mapping system. So whatever the mapping system says is where he currently is, or he just left, right? Okay, question here this. So through SMR, when uh, this move happened, let's say from Turkey to Paris, now the traffic which is already uh, on the fly, so on air, will it go to the first site, then tunnel to the Paris site, or will there be any optimization for the on the fly traffic as well, so that those traffic will go directly to Paris? Which one? Yeah, good question. So in the spec, we we've, we've said you could do either. What what the Turkey XTR could do is drop the packets and simply SMR to get the ITR to go to the new location, or it can actually do a lookup and say, well, let's see, I know the EID is not attached to me anymore. Let me do a lookup in the mapping system to see if there's an armo. This is the Turkey XDR. And the Turkey XDR has an option to now encapsulate it at the expense of a hairpin, right? Um, but what it can do is it can actually, it, it could drop packets and just do the SMR. It can hairpin the packets and also do the SMR, and then the ITR will eventually go this way. Now, when we talked to brokerage firms, they said, drop the packets, please, because what you're doing is you're causing, you're confusing TCP that the, the path is now, has different latencies. So it's better to drop it 
and get the new information and get on the new shortest path so we can compute a new RTT at the transport layer. You drop so the, the session or you drop some packets? You drop the session right. entirely or you, you drop some packets? Oh, no, no, just the packet. The session will not ever drop because it's a connection between EIDs. Yeah, IP address is not changing. TCP, still TCP, same TCP session will continue, but you will drop some packets there. And trade-off here, either you will increase latency but not drop the packets, or you will decrease the latency because you will have inbound path optimization directly between the ITR and the XTR, uh, and you are basically re reducing latency with this, and but you are dropping the packet. So you sh we should see the trade-off there. Okay. Yeah, you got it. That's correct. Okay, so let's look at how this could scale to 1 billion registrations. Well, you know, it's not really that hard, believe it or not. Uh, storing a lot of state is not the difficult scaling problem here. If you just um, deployed a map server, let me make it a little bit larger so you can see. If you deployed a map server that could only support 1 million entries, and then you had 1,000 of them, that's a billion entries being stored across 1,000 nodes. Now, these map servers can be servers, they can be routers, they can be appliances. Um, so they're, the cost to store entries and to process entries varies depending on the product type. But you know it's not unreasonable to just increase this by three orders of magnitude and say, oh, I can put um, one billion entries in a pair of map servers or a hundred million and make this number larger. But the point here was is let's see if we if we can store it in a simple system. Well, this system right here is managing what um, 1,110 nodes altogether, where there's 10 routes that fan, fan out an order of magnitude to 100 DDT nodes that can find 1,000 map servers. So the point of this is it's not the storage problem. The problem is is the map request load. Can the map request load be handled? So in this diagram, what I've said is, let me put the 1,000 map servers in this vertical diagram and show you we have the 10 routes here. And let's find out when there's 100,000 list sites that are looking up mappings, how it would be able to scale. Well, let's go ahead and put 1,000 map servers across all the ITRs that would want to use this system. And basically, we're doing a very wide cluster, or maybe 100, depending on what their performances per unit performances. Um, and then the ITRs load split data, and then they each have referral caches, so they'll know if they're looking for EID1 that's in this map server, if this guy's requesting EID100, it's in this map server. And therefore, the, the map request load is sent across these map resolvers. So it's usually just two hops. It comes, the, the map request comes from here to the map resolver and then goes to the map server and then a map reply comes back. These intermediate nodes are only used when a new EID comes that's not in the referral cache. So this root node DDT node is part of the DDT system, which we call the mapping database transport system. But the edge nodes here actually talk directly to map resolvers and map servers. So if we wanted to change a system in here, like build a DHT, or some other pub sub database like the Cassandra database, it would be easy to pull out DDT and put something in. Now for your Cisco guys that have been working on LISP for a while, you remember called something called LISP Alt, and that was using VGP and tunnels to connect map resolvers and map servers in the center. That was just another way to do a mapping database entry. The problem with LISP Alt, it could only support IPv4 and IPv6 EIDs. Today, the mapping system has grown up to support GPS coordinates, to support JSON entries, multi-tuple entries, um, um, distinguished names. You could actually build, put names in here and map them to things. So to be able to support that, we couldn't send these map requests through a BGP hierarchy because it looked like a data packet. But with a system like this, or any modern database system, we could, the key could be any type of value. So is this uh, map resolver deployed in a anycast fashion? Uh, yes, you can anycast it as well. In fact, uh, that's the segue. So what is a simple mapping system? And this is what Cisco deployed on a Nexus switch, which was an easy way to deploy it. 
in a in an enterprise now this system right here is basically a two box mapping system this could support um 10 million 100 million entries if you put it in a ucs box or any server type platform all you do is you tell all the xtrs to register to two different map servers these are two different physical devices and you tell them to register the the underlay ip address of the two map servers is 111 and 222 so you see these etrs will send map registers to both of them and then when you want to request mapping is what the itr will do will it'll send a request to an anycast map resolver address which let's say is 3333 so both these physical map servers are configured with the address 3333 that allows the itr to get to the closer map resolver so the map resolver and map server run um, together in this device but they we call this as a anycast map resolver as you just um, stated excellent so, so this closeness so for, instance, for instance when orhan left turkey and went to paris i said in that previous example you'd use the map resolver you were configured with that was assuming a unique address but if you were using a, um, an anycast address then when you were in Turkey, you were using a physical map resolver that was in Turkey, but now when you're in Paris, you're sending your map request over a few underlay hops to a map resolver that is sitting in um, Paris using the same Anycast address. So this is going to work a long way, let alone the previous slide. The previous slide is grand capital I um, internet, large scale, but we're finding in enterprise that this, is, this scales quite a bit. And I have this implemented in my mapping system. So when people want to experiment and they they want to play with LISP and they don't want to build a mapping system, um, I give them entries in my mapping system and they can use it to resolve addresses. So anybody on this call is welcome to use my mapping system. Just send me an email. It's free of charge and you can play around with LISP with any gear um, and it implements something similar to this. So there was a question actually uh, that... Uh if I don't know anything about this, but I want to understand uh, Lisp, can I do any demo? Can I play with it? Like, is there any simulation or something like that? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. We had a Lisp beta network at Cisco for many, many years that was just shut down. Cisco was managing it, and they moved the management of it to the guys at UPC Barcelona, and they were managing it for a good five or six years. Uh, they cannot support that anymore, so the Lisp beta network that had it was basically deployed in, in 50 countries. Um, I think there was about 300 XTRs that were talking to it. It was a pretty large network that we experimented for a long time. Um, now we need to find something. Um, you know, VeriSign was building a mapping system about 10 years ago and was going to monetize it and build it just like a certificate system. Um, and they stopped doing that. Uh, but if people want to play with it, um, I'm certainly willing to support the, the effort to do it so people can learn about it. Um, this example down here was showing, I, I mentioned this last time, where we were talking about who else implements LISP, and I was verbally, it was, I couldn't show it because we didn't have slide sharing work, mm -hmm. but this was an example where the lispers.net code was being used as the mapping system here, or, and then these four vendors, Arista, A10, are data plane vendors that were supporting this mobility thing. And what I said last week was, we had this VM in the data center using this EID 66666, and the VM was moving back and forth from, a, from an Arista top of rack switch to an A10 load balancer. And at the same time, we had a Mac that was moving across Wi-Fi to wired, and Aruba was providing the Wi-Fi access point and a pro curve uh, closet switch was being there. So we would move this from a cabled connection to an uncabled connection. And what we were showing is this guy was SSHing from seven to six. And while both movements were happening on each end, um, the mapping system was allowed to provide that continuous connection. At one point, six would be attached to two. And when it moved over here, Arista would be the Arlo. And then it would go back and forth uh, when seven was attached to Ruba, three was the Arlo, and then when it moved to the wired connection. So it's showing you in this case that the EID is moving, but the Arlo's are static. This core network is completely untouched and not known because these are coming out of provider uh, assigned space and these boxes are bolted into a rack and the core network knows how to route to these boxes. 
and it has allowed all this movements happening around the edges. It's the overlay that's providing the movement because we're updating these map servers with new R loads. By the way, when there is any cast the, and physical addresses, uh, reachability to the closest closest uh, map resolver is done by the underlay routing. So if it's on top of internet, Absolutely. we are talking about UGP. If it's on the private network, whatever the maybe IGP they have, it will provide. Any case, this is not a protocol. Any case, it's just an IP address deployment model. So you advertise same IP address from multiple locations. Yeah. yeah, and it's usually a slash 32 host address because you, you're you actually making connections or sending UDP packets to that address. So, and it's based, when it's in your enterprise, it's the enterprise IGP that's deciding what the metrics are because the OSPF shortest path to this one may be a better metric than it is to this one. So this map request packet actually flows on the shortest OSPF or ISIS path. And it is okay, as well across the DNS as well as uh, with constant delivery network. Very, yeah. very widely used. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Okay, so that's the mapping system in a nutshell. Um, maybe in the spirit of showing this mobility example, the 5G example, because you'll be able to find corollaries. What, what's been interesting with me working with LISP over this long period of time, um, you know, LISP, just to show you this slide, LISP turned 10 in 2016, and I gave a presentation about how LISP evolved since 2006 and the sort of things that happened across um, these years with products and deployments and what's fashionable and marketing and where we are and stuff. Uh, but um, what I learned was we're using the same fundamental um, EID R-Log split to support all these different use cases that just want mobility. And what we're doing here is we're just moving VMs around, VMs and containers or hosts that are being allocated, servers that are being allocated, um, are just assigning EIDs to entities. And an EID could be assigned to a microservice, a function, um, where the blockchain guys are even thinking of using IP addresses to address memory. And the whole blockchain is going to be a single computer system with memory that's splattered all over the place. And the way you write to a piece of memory is by sending a packet to an EID. And if you need to reallocate that block because you're doing some sort of memory banking or some kind of aggregation or rate type sort of uh, writes to scale the system, you can move these EIDs around where it's hard to do in a memory system. In a virtual memory system, we can do that because the single system has the virtual memory map to the physical memory map. But how do you do that across systems? Do you have a virtual memory address that is gonna be maybe, um, you call it an EID, but it looks like a memory address, or could it just be an IPv6 address or in some other form? Very interesting, you know, high performance computing ideas are being used by using locator ID separation at the network layer to help the computer model work. So, Let's talk about the 5G part of it, because what's interesting with the 5G, it's going to use the same mobility system here. And this is this won't take long. This is just showing you uh, how we will. OK, so the idea here is that um, we want shortest paths. The problem we have in the LTE network not right now is there's too much hairpinning for packets that need to go from a UE to the internet always flow across this next generation core or the EPC core, right? But when these two entities are moving around and they wanna to talk to each other directly, packets have to hairpin quite a bit. And if we wanna meet this one millisecond latency requirement for 5G, we have to send packets on the shortest IP path because anything farther you, we want to send faster than speed of light, but we can't do that without quantum networking that's showing that we can't do it either. So the fact that we're sending it through more electrical and optical links, through more routers with queues on it, is just meaning we're, we have a long ways to go just to get it on the shortest path here. So, so just it's very the, simple with the idea. Go ahead, or I have let, 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 What I understand, please uh, verify me. 
in the 4G network, packet would go from UE to E node Bs, right? So, uh, and then between the E node Bs, without going to the core, it can travel. And uh, no, it, it has anchor node, it has SP nodes infrastructure where you terminate your GPP tunnel, where you depend off to IP networking. You always have this. Yeah, 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 but this hairpin, what I am saying, you eat E not B, then I think over X2 interface to another E not B, then to another UE. So this type of hairpin we are talking. Here on the yeah, slide... Let me explain the slide. Don't say let me you could use X2, just a second. You could use X2 to end off within the same system. If you need to go to another network, exactly. you will go yeah. through Anchor node, you'll do decapsulation, you'll do... Many, many. Times. Definitely. GTP will be used as well in that case. And even the latency will increase more. Here, what I see in UE to UE directly. So it gets me exact, actually. Oh, great. So th what this slide is saying is that these two, the, the white link, the white arrow says the two UEs want to talk to each other, which mean maybe a TCP connection is being set up from this guy's EID to this guy's EID. Uh -huh. So how would that work? Well, to send it over... To, to be able to send the packet, you, what is, and we don't want to use encapsulation on the RAN because it's very sensitive to packet size. So the UE sends a packet to the G node B just like it does today. So we require no changes in the RAN network. But it turns out that the G node B discovers the ID and registers its RLOC address as part of the NGC core to the mapping system. And so does this guy. So when a packet is being sent from left to right, this guy does a lookup for right and sees that this is um, the R look. And so he simply just encapsulates it this way, okay? Where previously um, we would use S gateways and P gateways that were more, they were closer topologically to the internet, right? Because most of the packets would go to servers and back and there was no opportunity to do things here. So what would be nice is if you're in some disaster situation like a hurricane, and it's the towers are up, but the internet is down, you could still have these two UEs talk to each other over the cellular network. What I'm trying to do next is, in a neighborhood, I want these two UEs to be able to talk to Wi-Fi because they have the layer two connectivity or Bluetooth. And so this capability by, what I just mentioned is I could do that by having list mobile node run on here. This is an example of running list in the network that supports 5G versus um, not even worrying if this is connected to LTE or or 5G, that everything is done in the handset. And that's the next thing we'll go uh, we'll go to. But the idea here is that the EID and the RLOC are not co-located in the same system. So this, now what about this one? I mean, uh, is this at the moment proposal stage or? This is a internet draft in the list working group and it was presented to the CT4 group and 3GPP last year. So 3GPP Avero also, right? They're aware of this, yes. Okay. This is just showing a packet flow from a UE that would go to an EID that's in the internet. And obviously it's the UPF that is the interconnect to the internet that's the Arlo. So you see a regular packet go to the ENOB. And then this red says encapsulate to UPF, and then it gets decapsulated forward. Very simple. So those these are sorts of ideas that we're we're doing now. If this e, UE is moving back and forth, and this guy is a microservice that's moving between data centers, it's no different than this example right here. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Okay. By the way, that, UP, so that UPF uh, in five G came for. Uh, GGSN or Packet Gateway in 3G and 4G, and I think it's yep. called User Plane Function, right? Something like Correct. That. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's the sort of work we're doing in, in 5G. Now, now this is a good segue to say, uh, how do we do this without having to change the 5G network and get mobility? Well, that's stuff we've been doing so far today. And so the idea here is I did a, a very quick demo where I was running on my iOS phone, I'm writing Lisp. So here's my iPhone here with Lisp. And I, I assigned it an EID of 131313. 13, 13. I don't have to talk to anybody about that IP address. It could have been a random address. It could have been an IPv6 crypto EID. Long as that address is unique within the VPN that you're registering to the um, mapping system. 
And so what I was doing is I was making a connection to a container that was sitting on my laptop. Of course, the container was going through many levels of NAT, not just the Docker NAT, but also this was sitting at my house, so it was going through the Internet. And so what we were trying to do here is we were trying to um, basically ping 13 to 14 and making NAT traversal work. And what I was doing is I was turning on and off um, my LTE connection, moving this here, showing that the pings could continue. Okay. Now, what's even more important, this is an, an EID talking to an EID. In other words, a LISP system talking to a container that was running LISP. But I also wanted to be able to talk to my website, www.lispers.net, but that was not a LISP site. So the reason these are in red is because these addresses are all routable on the underlay and they're non-LISP sites. So what, so what I would do is I would encapsulate a packet from 13 to the IP address of www.lispers.net it gets encapsulated to an RTR, a re-encapsulating tunnel router that's sitting in Google, Google's GCP. Google would do a lookup in the mapping system for this guy's IP address to see if he was a LISP site or not so he, so he can encapsulate it to an Arlo. It turns out the mapping system says he's not an EID. Therefore, you have to send it directly, okay? Well, it turns out life is a little bit difficult because there's a NAT inside of GCP here and I just can't send it and expect the packet to come back. So what this box also does is a function called ListNAT, where it translates the source EID to the output interface that interfaces into this internet underlay. So when this ListPers.net system gets the ping message, it thinks it's just sending a packet back to the IP address of GRTR. And when the packet returns, then this guy retranslates the destination address from his interface address to 13. And then I'm able to use my iPhone for any internet, even though it's running list. I can talk to list flights or non list sites. And I could turn on and off LTE and Wi Fi and move back and forth while this is happening. And you don't if need you any proxy want, XTR. If you guys want, sorry, if you want to see the demo, just go ahead and download this movie and you can watch a four minute video on how it works. Go ahead, Warren, you had a question. So in this case, you don't need any proxy XTR between the LISP and non-LISP non sites, right? It, right. The function is using a proxy XTR or something called LISP NAT. So this is using the LISP NAT portion of it. And the reason is, is because with a proxy XTR, I have to inject the 13 EID or some course prefix of it into the underlying BGP routing system. I wanted this experiment to work without me talking to anybody, so I had complete autonomy in building this. That, so by natting, it was the only way to get non-list sites to get packets back to me. So there the advantage, disadvantage, the disadvantage is, is that this is a symmetric path. If there was a shortest path from WW listeners through maybe this RTR and AWS, it wouldn't work because the translating address is here versus there. Now yeah. I guess I get, mm -hmm. I guess. I could make the list translator use his address and spoof it, but of course, with URPF rules in effect, that packet would never make it to listers.net. So uh, there was a vo video cut, I mean voice cut as well. So you said that we have proxy XTR, which is Lisp net function here. Um, in the inner working draft, how Lisp talks down the sites, we have two solutions. One's called a PXTR, which you know about, Cisco, Cisco's implemented, and a list NAT function. Okay. It's not a regular NAT function. It's a list NAT function that does similar sort of things. It only does one-to-one -one address NATing. So an EID doesn't appear in the packet here. Because see, if an EID appears in a packet here, uh, then you have to use PXTRs, and they have to be, with, for this guy to send a packet to an EID, BGP has to know the underlying routing system has to know about the EID to route it to a PXTR, where here we're not using that. The fact that the packet's being rerouted back to this to, to this proxy device, I'm gonna call it, is because it's NATed it. So and it's based on this, I'm pointing here because there's an interface in, into the underlay here where that IP address is. And that IP address is a provider assigned address from GCP to my VM. So instead of encapsulation, you are doing NAT here, you need to. Otherwise, uh, if you want to exp 
encapsulation like what you do in PXTR case so that uh, lispers.net would need to know the route, return route for the EID space. So if you will do encapsulation, but here you are doing net, that's why lispers.net doesn't have to know EID's IP address, just they need to know how to go back to GRTR. Right. Okay. Actually, so actually, in this example, uh -huh. this, green li this green line is showing that packets are being encapsulated from the phone to GRTR. Mm -hmm. and so the, this packet here has two IP headers. This guy strips it off and translates, so there's only one IP header that's here. So this guy, if I, if I was going to SSH from my phone into lispers.net, this guy would be creating a TCP connection to what it thinks is the IP address on this interface here. Yeah, sure. By the way, there is a very nice question, though uh, we are going through the 5G use case, but uh, I don't want to miss this one. Maybe you have an uh, idea you heard about this uh, use case as well. He says, there was a test demo for Lisp for the airlines industry, I think Air France and Cisco. Can you explain to us the idea and benefits from Lisp with such an industry? Also, any successful story? So, airline industry, what they did actually is quite interesting topic. Yeah, that was a, that was actually a pretty simple problem that uses the same idea. And the idea was is let's say all these these two systems are sitting on the ground, and it was Lufthansa who was testing with it. Let's say these are the airplanes. What they wanted to do is they wanted a user to open up their laptop when they are sitting at the gate. They just board the plane. They're sitting at the gate and all the laptops on the um, plane were EIDs, okay? And they would run, um, would not run any list on the plane at all, similar to here. These guys aren't, these VMs aren't running lists, they're the airplanes. But these would be base stations on the ground, okay? And these, those would be the R loads. So the idea was is that the plane, when it moved away from the gate, would disconnect from the airport's Wi-Fi and maybe use the runway's Wi-Fi. And then when it got up in the air, it would use this thing called um, SkyFi. It was a 50,000 feet wireless standard that some guys in Sunnyvale were doing. And so it wanted these laptops to stay up and keep their connections up while we were switching between these different wireless technologies. And the idea was is that the LISP was on the ground. And as the plane would fly, fly over, these EIDs here would now attach to the hour looks on the ground. No different than this example here. So let's say this Arista box and A10 box are sitting on the ground, they're base stations, they're running list, and 66 now is flying over this one Arlo. Well, now all the Arlo's, all the EIDs on the airplane will have Arlo 1111. So when they send packets down and they send it to some server, all the packets will be now returned to 1111 because they're just getting encapsulated there because that's where the plane currently is. As the plane moves over to the to another base station, now it just updates its mapping to 222, and the same thing happens. Okay, in this, this case... What I'm saying in these three examples uses the exact same technology, same mechanisms, detailed mechanisms. Definitely. So here in this uh, case, uh, uh, let me ask this one, then uh, you, you probably continue, because it's very, very important for me to understand. Where, in this case, where you would put the map, MRMS, map resolver, map server, where would uh, you put them? So the the... Airline industry would, would run that, and they could run it as an independent thing. You just need you just need the mapping system to be accessible on ground, and that's all you would need it, need it to do. In this case, the mapping system here would be part of the ground infrastructure. That's but all. mapping system needs to be accessible by all those ARLOC, which is one of them you said, let's say, airline Wi-Fi, uh, airport Wi-Fi, another right. maybe uh, SkyFi. All of them needs to be accessible to that MRMS, so as long as they can uh, update the new RLOC location when there is move, uh, so it's fine, right? So they should be accessible. Yeah, don't, don't forget LISP is on the ground and the mapping system's down there too. And what's up in the air are all the EIDs that are mobile. Okay, think of it that way. Just, so if, just you're, if you're interested in a real use case, there's work that's going on routing working group uh, led by Fred Templin who worked for Boeing. And the name of the draft that describes it is ATF RTWG ATN BGP. So it uses BGP in very similar matter. Just look up uh, RTW uh, 
routing working group, drafts on ULC, number of drafts by Fred Tempting, talking about how can you use BGP to do exactly what you just described. Excellent. But and without also, without any list? There's also a few, there's also yeah, a few guys. There's also a few guys that are um, proposing a draft in the list working group from the ICAO, ICAR, International Carrier Airline Organization. And so they're trying to figure this problem out. They're working with Fred as well to solve this problem. Fred's looking at using LISP and BGP and what the pros and cons are in Arrow's a BGP-based solution that um, um, Jeff's referring to. Okay. Okay, so the um, the last so so just one plug for multicast. Not only did we do the unicast demo here, um, we also did a multicast demo, which was interesting, where you could join you could join a group and receive traffic. So here I was receiving video. I had a um, a VLC source um, in the container sending video, and the mobile phone was roaming around, attaching and deattaching from Wi-Fi to LTE and receiving two different streams, a video stream on one multicast address and a ping on the other. And so there's a demo at this location right here where you can watch that as well. I did these at the, I did the unicast demo in the summer ITF and did the multicast demo in the uh, fall ITF. So those are available for people to look at offline. Okay, so two more use cases. And is that okay? Do we have time? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to yeah. wait? Do you want to open up questions or? Actually, there are a couple of questions. Wants... Meanwhile, let's let's also uh, answer them. So there was okay. uh, your, in your 5G uh, use case, you said that even the, ba uh, I think, base station site goes down, uh, still it can continue because the question was, you talked about the disaster. But he says, but the disaster at the backbone means underlay is down as well. So how would overlay work? So do you remember the use case? Uh, great question. That actually provides a segue into the decentralized mapping system that is relatively, relatively new. And the idea here is in today's mapping system or in today's list network, you assume that the mapping system is part of the infrastructure. And the problem is, is if you lose your internet links, you would have no access to the mapping system, but you have these backdoor sort of paths, wireless paths. So what we did, did with something called LISP Decent, stands for Decentralized Mapping Systems, is that the, all the XTRs would be map servers for each other in a decentralized mapping system. So even though, even though this would happen, you could, it would look like this. These guys would all have mappings for each other so when they lost internet connectivity but had backdoor wireless connectivity, they could still resolve mappings. And they can do this, now they can do this with actually sending map registers to multicast addresses that reach all of them. That's the push phase because the wireless systems support multicast much more naturally. It's layer two multicast. So with a push based system, we can get a bunch of nodes in a neighborhood, in a neighborhood where there's a hurricane and they want it, and your neighbors want to talk to each other. You're sitting on a cul-de-sac or a, an area, a development area, and you want to talk to each other. All those guys can um, reach each other either by a local LTE tower or Wi-Fi or any other wireless technology they have running between. If, if I was running a microwave link between my house and my neighbor, I could use that as well. And of course, we're running LISP in our EIDs are still registered because we might still be roaming between those little wireless networks that are running in our neighborhood. And so the R looks might be changing. So cell site would be perfect place to put something like that because if you lose tower, obviously you have no connectivity whatsoever. Right. So you can still locally resolve if you can turn it down. Yeah, that's correct. So that so this decentralized mapping system is push based to solve the answer to the question. And then we also have a pull-based one, which basically distributes mappings using DNS and anycasting it. And we can we could um, talk about this another time if we want to. Sure. And I've deployed this mapping system for many blockchain use cases because you don't have to choose once you don't have to pick a seed node for for anything. You just you have the EIDs hash to these numbers. 
that are DNS names, and then the DNS names map to the actual locations of. So, so when you hash your EID to zero.ms.lispers.net, you will send map registers to both one and two. And when you want to send a map request for that EID, which will also hash to zero.ms.lispers.net, you could pick one or the other. Round robin. So, okay. Okay. So the blockchain is very simple. We want blockchain nodes to be able to, to go anywhere, roam around, and so that's why they run over an overlay. And, and what we have, let me zoom in a little bit here. With the blockchain application, of course, what we're doing is the blockchain runs up here at the session presentation and application layers. And as you guys know, Lisp runs at the network layer where it takes EID addresses from the transport layer and then sends packets out with an extra header with our lobes on the outer and then sends it to the data link. Um, I'm using, I've been working with a blockchain called Nexus blockchain and it's a daemon that supports um, all the protocol, blockchain protocol, as well as miners and wallets that are different applications. What they do is they send and receive from EIDs and then list, it runs over on top of lists. So this is kind of how we would work from an architectural diagram that the Nexus would run at the application layer run it, they open up TCP connections, and then LISP would, would go ahead and encapsulate packets. And then LISP would use underlay telemetry to actually inform the application, you may want to use this blockchain peer versus another one because I have better Arlo connectivity. Maybe one's multi-homed and the other one's not. Or you've been experiencing problems through at and I'll start encapsulating your packets through Verizon. These are the sorts of things where we, we could provide better connectivity for the Nexus applications. Also note that LISP can run in crypto mode where all encapsulated packets are first encrypted and then encapsulated. That means all Nexus um, transactions are all encrypted and kept private where the application doesn't have to do it now. So the wallet, the miner, and the daemon could all run over an encrypted overlay. Okay. This is how it actually works. If we want to transition it slowly, the Nexus apps can either send to RLOCs or to EIDs. And when it sends to an RLOC, it just uses the regular protocol stack where the RLOC is actually a routable IP address. And so it talks to existing nodes. But if it sends to an EID, then the Lisp code in the system intercepts the packet, does the mapping, and encapsulates it to RLOCs. We do that by just simply putting an IP route command identifying what the EID ranges for these applications. And so the source, the applications don't have to do source address um, selection. If they send to a 240 address, the source address that will be used is an EID. Therefore, list will kick in. If they send to something that's not in this range, it just passes through. And so we're able to get this Nexus blockchain to work both on the overlay and the underlay at the same time in the same connectivity uh, in the same blockchain connectivity. This is cool. first time I am seeing this use case. I will definitely look at it. Yeah, and we did a demo um, by showing how... Your microphone, so I, I Jeff, your microphone is muted. You said something, but... Uh, I would like to emphasize that the name of the system is Nexus. It's not Cisco Nexus Suite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the clarification. This is called the Nexus blockchain. It's an open source project. If you want to learn about it, go to nexus.io um, and you'll learn more about it. This has nothing to do with the Cisco products. <laughs> <laughs> this was an example of showing how we were using multicast and unicast to ping. And we had an MRMS container and we showed three demos here that we were doing a ping between these 10 containers. And then we were using crypto EIDs among those uh, 25 containers. And so we were doing some demos showing people how it worked. And we did the, the pull-based decent. Um, so these are pretty pretty much advanced topics. Yeah. I could take more questions or we can go into crypto EID since we're talking about it right now. I think we can uh, continue. Actually, I have okay. also uh, some questions from uh, last week maybe we can continue now and uh, meanwhile i can ask those well i think 
I think I'll be done after I show you this demo sure. of crypto EIDs. This is the IoT use case. Uh -huh. So what I would like to do is, it's only a minute and 45 seconds. If I run it, you can hear the audio um, from the from the movie. How does that sound? You want to do it? Okay, yeah. Okay, here we go. Show you a demo of the list mapping system. Can you hear the audio? PKI-based yeah. authentication. We have um, four nodes here and XTR1 is going to send map requests to the map server for XTR2's EID. It's first going to send one without a signature in the map request. Okay, I'm pausing for a second just to explain things. The EIDs here are IPv6 crypto EIDs, and um, what I'm showing here are the low order 16 bits of the EID. Okay, I'm going to continue. If you look at the top window, this top window is showing you um, the map server log that the authentication failed. The second map request that it's going to send, it's going to be using its own. Okay, so what I'm, let me explain a little bit better. This, this um, LIG is sending a map request um, to the mapping system for an IPv6 EID, which is a crypto EID. Since it's not supplying the source address, it's not using its crypto EID, so the map server can't verify the signature, and so it's supposed to fail. That's the last thing that happened. Now what I'm doing with this one is I'm using my IPv6 crypto EID, so the map request is signed and the map server is verifying the signature. That's what's about to happen now. Mm -hmm. In that case, signature verification passes, and what's returned is the RLOC of XTR2, which is 1.1.1.4, you see right here. Next thing we're going to try is sending a map request XTR1 for XTR2 with ZTR1's source address. Why, so why is XTR1 sending with a source address of ZTR1's? Because we're trying to spoof it to make sure that the map request is not accepted. Which means it's spoofing the source address. When it does that, you see it gets an authentication failure. Is the verification the signature verification doesn't pass because the crypto EID is not doesn't match um, the one that's in the signature, and then just for completeness, we'll try one spoofing for ZTR two. We see that um, this fails as well. So what's going on is that these three nodes are basically registering their EIDs, and the mapping system is doing admission control by verifying signatures on the map register message. So each of those systems are registering its IPv6 crypto EID. You see the map registers come in here to the map server, and the, the signature EID is basically, this is the IPv6 EID, which is a hash of the public key of that system. That system is signing the map register with its private key, and here's the signature. And then what's happening is the map server is looking up the public key and using that to verify the signatures of each of these registrations. That allows these guys to register the mappings, otherwise they could not. So that's on the map register side. What we showed in the example previously is we were map requesting. So not anybody can just, you know, in fact, if Oran wanted to jump into this and he wanted to send a map request, the only way he can do that is if we allowed him in instance ID 1000. In other words, allowed him in this VPN and he would have to use a crypto EID for a key pair that he generated. So the hash that's in his, his crypto EID would have to match his key pair, and then that public key is registered to the mapping system for verification. What are the use cases for this? I think this can be used in many places. Yeah, it can be used in many places, but it's being used specifically in IoT sensors and IoT gateways, so they can be authenticated without but, having to manage them. So the manu what that happens is the manufacturer creates the public-private key. The private key is put in a secure enclave or a TPM, and that's what's used both at the protocol layer and the application layer to onboard IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Because I also, see Also, it's a map request for each other. The map requests are signed, and the mapping system is doing signature verification um, on each of the map requests. Thanks for watching. So that's, that's where LISP is being used in the IoT use case, not to mention all the stuff that it's, 
that Cisco SDA is doing with these extended switches, this is extended mode thing. Um, and with IoT, it's a question of managing, doing an asset or inventory management of literally billions or tens of billions of devices out there. And we played around in the IoT world by being able to manage these devices by using their mapping system. Mm -hmm. you, you can also attach geo coordinates to these I, IoT sensors so you physically know where they are as well. So when you need to go ahead and, and locate them or um, replace them because of battery or wake them up or find power outages, you can then you you can register a map. You can register a geo prefix that gives you kind of a spherical area on Earth, and then you can find all the IoT sensors since they've been registered with geo coordinate points. You can find that those points are inside that area, and you can locate all the devices pretty easily. So these are a network database can do these sorts of things, not just using topological addressing, but naming and physical location addressing as well. We've also um, have built a, um, a ride sharing app that uses the Uber H3 tile mechanism. And we're able to map H3 indexes to multicast EIDs. And we're allowing people to join a multicast group when they enter an H3 tile at different resolutions. So there's a lot of interesting sort of things we can do with the mapping system. Um, as long as we just call it a, a key value store for use at the network layer for routing and addressing. A Did lot of people want to use it for other things like Active Directory or to replace DNS, but it's really used for network layer sort of stuff, routing. That was interesting why you said multicast EID. I mean, EID is the at the user side and those are even in multicast are unicast address. Why you said multicast EID? You mean multicast well, Arlo? Yeah, well, an S comma G Obviously, a source that's sending to a multicast group would um, be an EID because we want them to send from the EID and use the overlay. Mm -hmm. The 32 bits, that's the group address, that can be only known in the overlay. So the pair S, G is being registered as a, a multicast EID as one big entity. Oh. But uh, when, we, when, when we're using this ride sharing app, when you enter this H3 area, we want everybody in that area to discover each other. So what they do is they map the H3 into um, a IPv4 um, multicast address. And so they register that address, meaning they're interested in it. So when somebody bids to that multicast EID, then the mapping system unicast replicates it to all the R looks where those guys are actually at. So multicast is not really running on the underlay. We're doing head-end replication in the overlay to reach all those devices. And they just all join the same group because they have a common interest. They're in the same maybe two mile radius, 10 mile radius, 14 mile radius. And we do that so drivers and riders could discover each other. When, now, when you talk about that, it reminded me something, by the way, I was laughing because of that. I was talking with Pascal today. Jeff, you know him as well, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think you know Pascal. We've been around for a long time. Yeah, actually, I was just telling him, Pascal from uh, RPL, we, we will talk about, about uh, Ripple on Tuesday, by the way. So um, I told him, now in an hour or two, we will uh, have a session with Dino and Jeff. And he said, Dino, uh, he, he's, I, he, of course, he knows the list, but uh, he said, everywhere in networking. Dino is everywhere in networking. When you talk about multicast, it just reminded me we were talking list, but uh, I see that you are talking now. For a long time, that's it. Yeah, you are talking now uh, advanced multicast. Uh, it, it triggers me. Should we do also another multicast talk maybe with you? So uh, it's really great well, to listen. The, the main advantage of doing multicast with overlays is we no longer have to build trees. We're just tracking where receivers are for good or for bad. But the advantage of tracking receivers now, like in that ride-sharing app, is now I can use separate encryption keys for each one of those head-end replications, and I can now send multicast over an encrypted channel without having to share keys among multiple entities, because there's Diffie-Hellman done for each Arlo. Yeah. So, you know, this is something that the application layer has done for a long time by doing multicast at the application layer, but now we're actually doing it down at the network layer and head-end replicating where we need to, but using multi multicast underlay when we have it, right? 
Yeah. So, by the way, multi cam when layer two gives it to you, but when it, you don't have it, you still want to per you want to still produce of the multicast um, um, group model to the applications where people can join common content and only a single packet is sent. And we think the blockchain application is going to help because its scaling problem now is having 100 peers and they want to send the same transaction to all of them. And so it has to send it over the same, it has to send it over 100 sockets. TCP has to segment the packet and send 100 packets over the same physical link. Now it just sends one packet down a UDP packet, and then Lisp replicates it, and it's more efficient because it's done at a lower layer in the stack, right? So, but still head-end replication, is it? Yeah, head-end replication. So it's not but still, it's not a, yeah. It's not done at the application, it's not done at the transport layer, it's done at the packet layer, right? Packet layer, and if even if it's, yeah. changes where you find these three R lobes are part of a multicast underlay island, then you just multicast it once and the three will get them because the underlay can do it. So you mix the R log set can have a mix of multicast and unicast R logs in it. Okay. So by the way, uh, it's already 70 minutes we have been doing, but uh, there is one topic that I want to discuss with both of you. Jeff, please, uh, I want your comment as well on this because uh, there was, after our first discussion, uh, when we published this first video on uh, LinkedIn, there was uh, many people shared it, reshared it, commented, etc. Even uh, they comment on the people who shared it as well. Like uh, I remember, I think I won. Uh, he commented about the control plane scalability and data plane scalability. And I think he was referring EVPN, but mostly what I understood, he, he, he was trying to say, let's uh, spend maybe a little bit more money on the CPU so why we are talking about the always scalability of the Lisp, etc. I don't uh, bite it, etc. So of course, Lisp is another solution. People probably don't want to accept that. There are always lots of solutions and we need to just look at the trade-offs. And uh, for any given problems, we can have solution. It's not always throwing the money. Uh, and I give an example. I, I answer that one in this way that, okay, it's like uh, talking about throwing more bandwidth versus deploying quality of service. I mean, uh, when it comes to CAPEX versus OPEX, we can give many examples like that. So how we can uh, make the system scalable using Lisp in the control plane, especially. So this is very important, especially when it comes to IoT and millions of uh, devices comes now into the campus network, etc. That's why we talked about the Lisp scalability. Now I want to hear from both of you, please. From the control plane as well as scale, uh, data plane aspect, Let's talk about the scalability of not only Lisp, but also a little bit about eVPN. So SD Access today is using Lisp as a control plane, but it could be, it seems that uh, there was an argument, why not eVPN? Uh, why Lisp? Why not eVPN for SD Access? Is it for scalability only? If, if yes, uh, how Lisp is uh, more scalable than eVPN? Uh, both of you, please, uh, maybe we can start with Dino. Well, the main use case and functionality that SDA wants to bring is IP address mobility. And so IP addresses would be moving around quite a bit and those extended switches that do IoT have the opportunity of moving around as well. And the question is, is PGP was never designed for routes to flap quickly. It could flap as quickly as you want the protocol machine to do it. But we put, in the early days, we put route flap dampening in it to slow it down so we would get more scalability than mobility out, out of it. So there's a trade-off between scalability and mobility. And in the campus, they wanted to be able to support L2 mobility, MAC address mobility, as well as IP address mobility. And rather than using lots of resources of pushing all these frequent updates, because everybody's moving around, if, if you move around quite a bit and you just use an underlay, you have to inject those routes everywhere. And you're injecting routes to all peers or you're running Dijkstra if it's an IGP to all these different places that may not even care about the change, but they have to spend the CPU and memory and bandwidth resources um, to, 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 be, to reflect that um, route change. And so um, that's why 
that's why they decided to use a pull-based system versus a push-based system. And that's the fundamental difference between a list mapping system and BGP that EVPN uses. So with EVPN, when you use BGP, because you would push the moved information to everywhere, not just the uh, one who is looking for. Uh, this is important. Yeah. What you would say, Jeff, I want to also hear from you, please. Yeah, so the fundamental difference is indeed push versus pull model. So in uh, EVPN case, when mobility event happens, new location will notify the rest of the network, look, this guy has moved, and by using some particular attribute, such as mobility community, it will also inform everybody, look, I know the newer location. So please use me, or I'm the airlock actually, for the MAC address. Right. So, um, it meant for very specific use cases and again a peer routing in EVPN was put on top. It's not native to EVPN, right? Uh, that's why we added IP bracket type 5 route much later for different use cases. So the natural use case for EVPN is automobility. When MAC addresses move, there is a machinery that is pushed back to notify the network. And by the way, it doesn't go, the console plane goes to everywhere, but only nodes or devices that are interested in the data are important. So devices that share the same TDI. You know, it, it, so it is service aware in a way. But again, focus here on L2 because EDPM, guess what? E stands for Ethernet. It doesn't stand for anything else. That's right. Yeah. So if you look at least, it's full based and it focuses on IP mobility. Even so, if you look at RP solution in SDA, it's actually, it's not flat. You would use list field to get the guy who owns the IP address to figure out the MAC address. So it's very different in a way. It's really IP driven in a way while EVPN is natively to Ethernet. So you might argue they operate a different player. So in SDA, SDA wants to support both L2, VP, L2 overlays and L3. Um, and that's why it chose VXLAN as its encapsulation format, because it wanted to use one encapsulation format for layer two frames or layer three packets. And so the mapping system that's being supported for SDA stores both IPv4, IPv6, and MAC addresses as EIDs. So it could run one centralized mapping system that can support all those different packet flows in EID types. So for operational perspective, I would argue if you have already deployed EVPN and you use it for primarily L2 mobility as well. So L2 mobility is going to work on top, right? Because yeah, that's right. Yeah, for sure. update, uh, so when you get new type to route, it will also have the IP address in our country, right? So if you use EVPN already and your primary use case is L2 mobility with L3 as part of working and probably deploying this on top of it might not make sense. If you're an SDA user and you've deployed SDA which has this inherently in it and you're using it and it works for you, it works for you. I right? want to if I want to discuss this one. Yeah. I want to discuss well, this one because both of you said this one, but it's not maybe clear. Guys, can you uh, please, maybe in a minute, can we uh, clarify this? What do you mean by IP mobility versus MAC mobility? So layer 2 mobility versus IP mobility. Can you make it very clear? Absolutely. So MAC mobility means your MAC address moves. Your forwarding is based on MAC address. You forward, you operate player two, you emulate switch. You forward towards destination MAC address. In IP mobility, you route towards destination IP address. So you operate in different outside layers when you make it routing or switching decisions. This is the fundamental difference. And uh -huh. with the MAC mobility, you're in the same IP space. So it has to be the same subnet. In IP, it could be anything. You route based on your destination, and you need a routing protocol to resolve where your destination So in uh, make mobility case, layer 2 mobility case, IP addresses on both sides, same. But with the IP mobility case, IP addresses on both sides can be different. It's not the same as the subnet, because this is your bridging boundary, because if you want to bridge between different IP subnets, you need to route. You cannot bridge. So there are different IP addresses with the IP mobility, different IP address. That's it. Yes. So okay. when you do we don't, address, we don't have boundaries on subnet. Within bridging, you do. Yeah. Dino, you want to add yeah, something? I just, wanted, 
I just wanted to add to what Jeff was saying. When you have MAC address mobility, what's changing is your MAC address is moving to a new location. It does. It assumes everything above the stack hasn't changed. So it assumes the IP address stays the same. Well, how do you move a MAC across subnets? You can't. So therefore, you have to make the subnet, whatever your mobility domain is, the subnet has to stretch because the IP address has to stay on the same subnet. Because it assumes that the ARP cache and everything else that's being done, it doesn't change. Because So it's really a layer two mobility function. Yep. When we say IP mobility, we mean the IP address is actually moving from one subnet to a completely different subnet, where subnets now really don't mean anything. Because subnets imply you have a home topological location. This is why we call it EID mobility, which means the IP address that's been assigned to your system is independent to anything that you're attached to. It's not a subnet. In fact, um, when Goldman Sachs implemented VM mobility, they wanted to call it a mobility prefix, where they would allocate EIDs out of, mob out of a mobility prefix. And that prefix was not assigned on any physical cable anywhere in the network because it was an EID prefix, a policy prefix, and not a subnet that was part of the underlay. So uh, if you look into implementation, so VMware has been doing uh, Vmotion over layer two for the last 50 years, right? Yep. Why layer two? Because you preserve your MAC address, you preserve your IP address. It must be the same for application, not so much any differences. And this is the requirement to do hot mobility. So zero packet low zero interruption. If you do cold mobility, obviously you could copy all your data to another host give it another IP address, give it another MAC address, drop some packets. So it's really, the use cases are different. And when you do hot mobility or emotion like case, you have to preserve all stuff on top of your MAC list. And this is what we That's why you call it uh, make mobility in case of emotion. Yeah. Yes. I mean, emotion is much more than just MAC. With the advent of LISP, what we said is you can now do vMotion and keep your IP address and you can move it anywhere on the internet. You don't have to move it to a place that allows it, that requires it to be on the same subnet. That subnet doesn't have to be over there. Definitely. Because what's being registered through the mapping system is a slash, through, a slash 32 address to the mapping system, not injected onto the underlay. That's right. And the uh, so immobility right problematic in EVP analyzed deployments because you're trying to summarize your address, right? Right, right. When you move you move your host route, so slash thirty two, slash one twenty eight, into a place where there's actually another subnet, so you cannot summarize anymore, you can't aggregate. You end up with all the host routes floating around. So there's no hierarchical structure anymore. So, so eventually you just run so out of space. So Jeff, it's then funny that you say that Jeff is because um, we were doing we were doing something called personal area networking, and we were trying to use Lisp um, and show that we could actually move prefixes, and this was useful for the cloud case as well, the hybrid cloud case, where what you do is you assign an EID to your phone, your sneakers, and your shirt, and they would all be out of the same power to EID prefix, and the reason is is because all three of those things would move at the same time. The R loop was the phone. And so those three devices would maybe Bluetooth to this list XTR right here. And since I would lose my connection from AT&T to Wi-Fi, it turns out that those three EIDs would change R looks all the time at the same time. So there's no reason to have three entries, especially since they map one R loop in the mapping system. So if you allocate them in a slash 31 or a slash 30 or something, then you can uh, originate the slash 30. And that was a way for us to reduce the number of entries in the mapping system. So yet another level of scale we could add. Does it have to be lift t-shirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, okay, that last uh, point, Jeff, uh, it's obvious for Dino because anyway, his system was selected, but uh, do you think that LISP is a right choice for the SD access control plane or would it be eVPN as well? So I assume uh, their product management has their decisions to make. And LISP is a great technology. EVPN is a great technology. And SDA is much more than just routing, right? Uh, or mass mobility, it's a... The product it does many more things. So I, I don't think I, I can judge from my where I am 
on whether the product management decision was right or wrong, right? So both technologies are mature, both are working. Both yeah, place but it, I think it was nice. Right it was nice to even compare Lisp and EVP. And although here the father of Lisp is here, but uh, we did this comparison for the SD access networks uh, because it is, to be honest, uh, getting more and more popular every day. And people are asking uh, me as well: Are you providing SD access training? Blah blah blah. And uh, I can understand from there, Lisp. Uh, that's why. It was another topic. We couldn't go into the uh, lots of questions still I have, but we will finish it now. Uh, the, another question uh, was, we are seeing at the moment lots of lots of books. I just know three books actually uh, written in last six months, published at least in last six months on Lisp. Uh, most of these books becoming, uh, I think, because uh, many use cases now we are seeing with Lisp, not only... Uh, VM mobility, it was a huge use case, but lots of others. But SD access is making, I think, Lisp uh, very, very popular. And it will be because we, people want to understand behind the scenes what's happening. Uh, Jeff, also, you've seen that and you recommended that book as well. Tony Pasen and wrote and uh, I, I read that one was nice. So uh, Lisp is getting very popular. I think we will have another session as well. I will... Uh, follow up hopefully we will find the time again with the Dino he can allocate his time for us and it was great talk guys so I'll get on top of it even if you don't use Lisp I would really advise you to use ITF documentation especially on Lisp fundamental and DDT so Dino close your eyes Dino is an extremely creative and knowledgeable person so anything he has done is definitely worth reading and just there's so much experience and knowledge. You would understand why particular decisions were made. You might use actually in very different ways. That's it's an amazing reading, high quality stuff. And, De definitely, definitely it. agree with Jeff. And uh, not only from my readings, also whoever I told say say the same thing about Dino. Uh, I would I would consume, and I am of course consuming any material he creates. I recommend you the same things, guys. Uh, it was a great session, and I think it's already one and a half hour now. So uh, for the next session, uh, please, uh, guys, stay tuned. We will have, hopefully, the third one as well. And please um, follow the YouTube channel, like the video, and comment it. Also, when we share on uh, social media, please, if you find this useful, if you, find, uh, if you want to see Dino and Jeff again in the show, so please uh, reshare it and uh, these videos really worth much more views and uh, I, I believe that uh, these people are really really busy and I'm trying to get them together. So uh, thanks a lot. Bye for now.